Good morning. Hope you guys are doing good. So for today's lecture, we shall uh, discuss about anchorage. So now you've decided to move teeth. So once you've done that, uh, you've also decided what kind of appliances you're going to use uh, to move these uh, teeth. Uh, so how do you establish uh, the movement of teeth? Or how do you go about moving teeth without uh, having any negative impact on the teeth which you don't want to move? So basically what I'm trying to say is if you want to achieve a certain kind of movement, you have to use certain teeth, uh, either uh, a set of teeth or a group of teeth, or you have to use certain uh, bones so which can be intraoral or extraoral and then you will use these to affect movement so these units will form the support which you will use to move other teeth into their ideal positions so that is what anchorage is all about So for the learning outcome, uh, once we've completed today's lecture, you should be in a position to outline the different types of tooth movement and types of force used in orthodontics, define and classify anchorage, outline the types of anchorage, and also discuss the planning of anchorage. So we shall start with uh, the definition uh, for anchorage. So it was Graeber who uh, defined anchorage as the nature and degree of resistance to displacement offered by an anatomic unit when used for the purpose of affecting tooth movement. Uh, Moyers put it in even more simpler words, resistance to displacement. So uh, we shall now go into the classification uh, put forth by Moyers. So anchorage can be classified based on the site of anchorage, the manner of force application, the jaws involved, and also on the number of anchorage units. So when it comes to site of anchorage, it can be intraoral or extraoral. The manner of force application, it can be simple, stationary, or reciprocal. And the jaws involved, intramaxillary or inter intermaxillary. And the number of anchorage units, it could be single, compound, multiple, or reinforced. So the first source of anchorage we'll be discussing is uh, based on the site, uh, which has been divided into intraoral and extraoral, uh, wherein intraoral is further divided uh, based on uh, teeth, alveolar bone, basal bone, and the musculature and uh, the extra oral is divided into cranial or the occipital back of the neck that is the cervical and also the use of facial bones so we shall now go into a little more uh, details so uh, the first uh, division under the site which is intraoral will be teeth so again here you have four more divisions to it. So it can be based on the number of roots, based on the root form, based on the inclination of a tooth, and also the root length. So as you know, each tooth is different and each tooth has a different root form. It can have one to three roots. It can have different inclinations and also the length of the root of a tooth can be of varying lengths. So all these have to be considered when you're planning on using a certain kind of a tooth as an anchorage unit. Okay, now coming to uh, the root form of teeth. So here uh, there are three kinds. One is round, flat, and uh, triangular. So I have color coded them uh, uh, the green ones uh, represent the round um, root form. The blue dots will represent the ones uh, which have a triangular root form. And the red dots will represent the teeth which have 
a flat root form. So uh, the round root form uh, offers the uh, least anchorage. That's because uh, um, the way the periodontal uh, fibers are attached to these teeth uh, depends the, the kind of stresses uh, these teeth can withstand. So when it comes to teeth with uh, round uh, root forms, uh, the periodontal ligaments are usually stressed in all the directions, so they do not offer a sound anchorage. Okay, and uh, the next root form, the flat ones. Uh, the flat ones, uh, uh, some of the examples are uh, mandibular incisors or uh, uh, mandibular molars. So here what happens is they, uh, these teeth can uh, resist uh, the tooth movement in a mesiodistal direction when compared to a labiolingual direction. Uh, again, this is uh, because uh, of the arrangement of the periodontal ligament fibers, which um, are attached to the flatter surfaces of these teeth. And hence, they can uh, uh, resist a mesiodistal uh, movement better than a labiolingual movement. And uh, uh, the, the third type, the triangular uh, root form, uh, these teeth um, are considered to provide uh, the maximum uh, resistance. Uh, uh, and some of the examples of these teeth are uh, maxillary central incisors and canines. Uh, how about the number of roots? So you know uh, the number of roots can be different when uh, different teeth are taken into account. So again, uh, based on the number of roots and based on the tooth which you want to move, you'll have to decide which tooth can be an anchorage unit. Of course, a posterior tooth like a molar which has two or more roots can definitely um, help in the movement of an anterior tooth which has one long root. Uh, however, if you want to use a canine which has a very, very long root and it's quite uh, deeply uh, embedded in the alveolar bone, so you might want to consider adding an additional molar so that there are no undue effects on the tipping of the molar or uh, closure of the space uh, affected by either movement of the molar tooth or uh, the tipping effect on the canine and the movement of the canine tooth. So these are uh, some of the examples wherein you have to decide as to what kind of um, anchorage you will be using and how many teeth you will be using based on the tooth you want to move and based on the number of roots a particular tooth has. Uh, how about a root length? How does a root length uh, affect anchorage? So if it's a multi-rooted tooth, uh, it's logical that it will be uh, offering more resistance to movement when compared to a single-rooted tooth. The same way a longer-rooted tooth will offer more uh, anchorage when in uh, comparison to a shorter-rooted tooth. Uh, as we discussed earlier, a, a triangular-shaped root with uh, a triangular root form, okay, will definitely offer more anchorage support than a conical or an ovoid root. And uh, finally, if the tooth surface area or the, the root surface area is more, so you can automatically uh, understand that there will be more periodontal support and there will be more periodontal uh, fibers holding the tooth and they can offer more uh, resistance to any kind of movement when compared to uh, teeth uh, we, which have smaller surface area. The next parameter we shall uh, discuss is the inclination of a tooth. As you can see in the image, uh, the molar tooth is mesially inclined and uh, let's uh, take it as an instance wherein you are trying to retract the skinine into the extraction space. So what happens here is, because of the mesial inclination of the molar, it provides an unfavorable anchorage unit because 
the, mom the moment you start retracting this canine, the molar is going to tip more into the extraction space and hence there will be loss of anchorage okay or loss of support or loss of resistance for any kind of retractive force you want to apply on the canine tooth so uh, a mesially inclined tooth will provide less anchorage when uh, a tooth is uh, being pulled or retracted towards the same direction okay However, here a distally inclined tooth uh, will offer a favorable uh, anchorage unit. The reason being, whatever we spoke about a mesially inclined tooth, it's just the opposite of that here. If you want to retract the, the canine into the extraction space, uh, it will be easier to do because even though uh, there will be some amount of uh, mesial inclination of the molar tooth, that's a positive moment and that's a positive result uh, which you can achieve uh, during the moment or retraction of the canine tooth. So uh, to summarize, a distally inclined tooth uh, will provide a more favorable outcome or will provide a more favorable anchorage unit when compared to a mesially inclined tooth. So what do you think of an ankylosed tooth? So do you think uh, these teeth can provide any kind of an anchorage? Mm, the straight answer would be yes, they can. And they can be used as uh, uh, anchorage units because uh, um, the pathology uh, of an ankylosed tooth is such that there, are, uh, there can be calcification around the roots and the tooth will form a very strong anchorage unit which will uh, you know prevent any kind of movement of that particular uh, anchorage unit so uh, basically an ankylose tooth can be used as a favorable uh, anchorage unit okay the next structure which can um, aid anchorage is the alveolar bone so uh, the investing alveolar bone which is uh, which surrounds the root structure can also support uh, anchorage by resisting any tooth movement however you'll have to assess the quality of this uh, so you can do an iopa or you can do a opg and then look for uh, uh, the health of the alveolar bone check the height of the alveolar bone and check for any uh, periodontally compromised uh, bone or any uh, pathology surrounding the root uh, of the teeth and if you're happy that uh, these teeth do have sound or good quality alveolar bone then you can use uh, these to aid in anchorage so however um, uh, you have to understand that too much pressure will uh, result in uh, the bone remodeling around the tooth and hence uh, you have to bear in mind that uh, uh, the, the amount of force applied on uh, the investing alveolar bone cannot exceed a certain limit uh, if the force is within that range so you can definitely use it as an anchorage site okay now coming to the basal bone so you can see on the image uh, the bone which is just adjacent to the root structure is the alveolar bone uh, the basal bone is at the posterior surface of the alveolar bone which is more dense and it can provide uh, better uh, resistance to uh, any kind of movement and uh, here uh, you can use the uh, anterior uh, mandible uh, or the lingual surface of the anterior mandible as an anchorage unit to uh, uh, affect certain kind of uh, moment of teeth. Uh, however, in the uh, maxillary arch, you can use the anterior palate to aid in anchorage.
Okay, here you can see um, examples of different kinds of implants. So how do implants aid in anchorage? So uh, simply put, they will support or they will aid in absolute anchorage. So if an implant is placed at uh, strategic positions in the upper uh, jaw or in the, uh, the lower jaw, so these teeth can, I mean, these uh, implants can actually act as absolute anchorage units, aiding in uh, resisting any kind of uh, unwanted movement and also uh, aiding in the movement of uh, teeth uh, into their desirable position. So you can use it with certain other kinds of anchorage uh, we've just discussed previously, or you can use it as a standalone anchorage as well because it will provide an absolute anchorage. What do you think about uh, the musculature around the teeth? Can they aid in any kind of uh, an anchorage? Uh, yes, they do or they can. Uh, so here is an example of lip bumper. So what's happening here is imagine that the patient has a hypertonic uh, musculature of his uh, lips that is the lower lip okay for an instance so you can use the hypertonicity of the musculature to uh, aid in um, providing an anchorage to uh, uh, you know the mandibular molars so what's happening here is the hypertonicity in the musculature or the force is translated into the lip bumper and the force from the lip bumper is uh, finally translated onto the teeth, preventing them from moving uh, in a mesial direction. So basically the force from the lip is uh, utilized by the lip bumper to prevent the movement of uh, the mandibular anterior teeth mesially. So uh, this is a good example of how you can utilize the, the tonicity of the musculature uh, for uh, affecting any kind of tooth movement or to augment uh, another kind of an anchorage unit. We shall now discuss uh, a bit on the extra oral anchorage units. So these are uh, resistance units situated outside the oral cavity and uh, the anatomic uh, units uh, involved here are the cranium, occiput, uh, the back of the neck or the nape of the neck, and the face as such. And so uh, the, the first image on the left shows a high pull headgear wherein uh, the support or uh, the anchorage uh, or the, the resistance is from the cranium and the occiput. Okay, and when it comes to a cervical pull healthcare, it is derived from the back of the neck, and when it comes to a face mask, it is used. Uh, uh, it uses uh, rather uh, the, the frontal bone and the, the chin. So these will augment any force and uh, aid in movement of teeth. And these can be used as extra oral anchorage units. Okay, the next classification uh, according to Moyers was uh, based on uh, the manner of force application. So here it is again divided into um, simple, stationary and reciprocal. So we shall start with simple. So what is simple anchorage? So simple anchorage is when the resistance of the anchorage unit to tipping is uh, utilized to move another tooth or teeth. So in simpler words, resistance to tipping okay, is a simple anchorage. How do you achieve it? So simple anchorage is usually obtained by engaging uh, a greater number of uh, teeth or units than uh, the teeth which have to be moved. Okay, so here uh, if uh, the combined root surface area of the tooth is uh, double that of the teeth to be moved, then you can term it as simple anchorage. So you get a more clear picture when you look at the image here. The number of teeth being used are more when, uh, I mean, in comparison to the tooth which is being moved, okay? So that's the simple uh, explanation for a simple 
uh, anchorage. So the next kind of uh, anchorage is stationary anchorage. So here, uh, uh, how do we understand stationary anchorage? So resistance to any bodily movement is stationary anchorage. So it is defined as dental anchorage in which the manner and application of force tends to displace the anchor unit bodily in the plane of space in which the force is being applied. Okay, so uh, as you can see in the image, if you want the uh, central incisor to um, rotate, then there will be some amount of bodily movement or resistance to the bodily movement exerted by the molar tooth. Okay, so this is a fine example of a stationary anchorage. And also you can see the other image. If uh, you want to retract the lower uh, anteriors, uh, the resistance um, offered by the molar and the premolars uh, will prevent any kind of a bodily movement. Okay, so that is stationary anchorage. Uh, the third type of anchorage we are discussing will be uh, reciprocal anchorage. Here, uh, the term generally refers to the resistance offered by two malposed units when the dissipation of equal and opposite forces tends to move each unit towards a more normal occlusion. This is evident in the, uh, the image on the top right corner. So if you want to close uh, a midline diastema, for instance, so when you use any kind of force to close a midline diastema and move the teeth uh, towards each other using uh, forces which are equal and opposite to each other will be a reciprocal anchorage. Okay, uh, so uh, here you can also use two or more teeth moving in opposite direction uh, and these are pitted against each other by the appliance. So the other two images uh, throw some more clarity into what I mean by reciprocal anchorage. Next uh, classification uh, was based on the jaws involved. Uh, so the first one is uh, the intramaxillary anchorage. Uh, here, when the when all the resistance units are situated within the same jaw, okay, within the maxilla or within the mandible, it is called uh, uh, intramaxillary anchorage. Uh, so again, this can be uh, simple, stationary, or reciprocal based on the same uh, criteria as we discussed previously. The other kind of uh, uh, anchorage is the intermaxillary anchorage wherein uh, the resistant units are situated in one jaw and uh, the effect is uh, for the movement of the tooth in another jaw. So the anchorage unit can be in the maxilla and the teeth uh, uh, which need to be moved might be in the mandible or vice versa. So uh, when you utilize such anchorage, it's called intermaxillary anchorage. Um, uh, the images uh, below uh, will uh, give you a much more clarity uh, as to uh, what intermaxillary anchorage is all about. So here uh, you're using the uh, upper uh, molar to affect movement on the uh, the lower quadrant, uh, whereas uh, the other image shows uh, you're using the upper uh, uh, teeth to affect movement on the lower molar. A few of the examples of uh, intermaxillary anchorage uh, will be class 2 elastics or uh, class 3 elastics. So I'm not going to go into the details. I hope you already understand what is class 3 elastics and what is class 2 elastics. So the images uh, will uh, definitely make you understand uh, how uh, an intermaxillary anchorage works. The next kind of anchorage is uh, based on number of units. So it can be uh, single or uh, primary. So here, um, if you want to move a tooth and uh, you pit the tooth against one another, that is, uh, a tooth which has more alveolar support is pitted against a tooth which has less, okay? For example, 
uh, a molar uh, tooth fitted against the premolar. That is, if you want to affect the movement of a premolar, you can use the uh, molar as an anchorage unit, and uh, that will be a, a classical example for a single anchorage unit. Uh, the next uh, type is uh, compound uh, anchorage, wherein um, uh, the anchorage provides for the use of more uh, teeth with greater anchorage potential to move a tooth or group of teeth with lesser support. Uh, here you can see uh, 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 the teeth being moved uh, using uh, uh, one or more uh, anchor uh, units. So when you see uh, several teeth put together and used as a unit to move one or more teeth, that will be an example for uh, compound anchorage. So further examples of compound anchorage uh, is when you have used uh, more than one type of resistance. Uh, so uh, an example would be the top uh, uh, image wherein uh, it's an extracranial uh, anchorage using the cranium and the occiput. And also there is, uh, uh, you know, the, the use of transpalatal arch so you can use uh, these to augment the anchorage needs for a particular uh, individual. Uh, also, you can uh, reinforce the anchorage by adding multiple dental units. Uh, so if you use more teeth or uh, extra oral structures um, as part of uh, an anchorage, uh, the reaction force will be distributed over a larger uh, periodontal area and thereby uh, it can affect uh, a more uh, a definite movement and also it can uh, reduce the pressure on uh, anchors uh, units as such. So uh, another example would be the use of uh, the lingual arch wherein two molar teeth are uh, fitted together and uh, 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 used as uh, uh, you know uh, anchorage augmented by these two teeth. So that's uh, uh, compound anchorage. So uh, when it comes to anchorage, uh, there's also something uh, known as uh, anchorage planning. That is, you'll have to decide before the initiation of any orthodontic treatment, you have to assess the anchorage needs for that particular individual. So also it depends on the kind of malocclusion a person is suffering from. Uh, the kind of uh, movement uh, you have to undertake, uh, whether it is maxillary or uh, intermaxillary or intramaxillary, uh, the number of teeth uh, to be moved and uh, the periodontal status of uh, that particular individual. So all these uh, things will uh, help you or you'll have to uh, assess all these things uh, and uh, thereby come to uh, a decision as to what kind of anchorage you will be utilizing. So, however, uh, you can uh, uh, sort of uh, divide these into uh, the duration of tooth movement. So, if the duration of tooth movement is longer, so there will be more demand on the anchorage needs of that uh, for that particular uh, individual. If the number of teeth being moved are also more, there is more demand, uh, the type of teeth being moved. So slender teeth will be less anchorage. However, if it's multi-rooted teeth or longer teeth such as canines, then the anchorage demand would be more and also the type of movement. So if there is a bodily movement, so definitely there will be more demand on the anchorage when compared to uh, tipping, so even rotation. Uh, so it depends on the kind of uh, movement of the teeth as well and the position of these teeth in the arch. So that's uh, uh, planning of anchorage and uh, these are all the different parameters you'll have to remember before you set out to uh, correct uh, a certain uh, malocclusion state. Here we are classifying anchorage demands as group A maximum, group B uh, moderate and group C minimum. So we shall start with maximum anchorage. So here uh, in cases where anchorage demand is very high, 
not more than one fourth of extraction space should be lost by forward movement of the molars. Okay, so if you uh, look at the image, uh, so imagine that the first uh, premolar was extracted to retract the anterior teeth. So uh, there shouldn't be more than one quarter or um, you know, 25% of the extraction space lost by the forward movement of the molars. So you can see the arrows. So the movement of uh, the anteriors, uh, the, the, the distance they have traveled is more in comparison to the amount of uh, distance the molars have moved. So this distance should be not more than 25% of the extraction space. So uh, if you want to uh, uh, restrict the moment then you'll have to uh, use maximum anchorage and uh, such cases would definitely require uh, more than one kind of anchorage and you'll have to augment them together to affect uh, maximum anchorage and also uh, uh, see the, the resultant uh, tooth movement. So uh, the next uh, kind of um, anchorage is moderate or the next group is a moderate anchorage. In these cases uh, the anchor teeth can uh, move uh, one quarter to one half or else 25 to 50 percent of the extraction space. So again, if, if you can see the image, you will see that uh, the moment of uh, the molars and, uh, and the moment of uh, or the uh, moment of the anterior teeth towards each other uh, is uh, similar. That is, uh, both of them have uh, moved uh, a similar distance okay to cover that extraction space uh, so you can see the, the length of the arrows is more uh, is 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 uh, equal so that is moderate anchorage uh, finally uh, the group c is a uh, minimum anchorage in these cases the anchorage demand is very low uh, so you can allow more than half of the extraction space to be closed by forward movement of molars so here it is opposite to that of a maximum anchorage. You can see the arrows. Uh, the, the front teeth or the anterior teeth have moved lesser in comparison to the amount of distance the molar teeth have moved. So that is minimum anchorage. Anchorage can also be achieved uh, through the use of uh, removable appliances. So however, there are uh, some basic components which are utilized and also there are some active uh, elements to it. So the basic components of a removable appliance will be the base plate and the, the, and the clasps, whereas the active elements are the labial wire, the springs, screws, and uh, elastics. So uh, if you see the image, you can see uh, the various components uh, you know, being used uh, for uh, uh, an anchorage requirement using a removable appliance. So you can see the base plate, you can see uh, springs, you can see uh, uh, the clasps. So basically all these put together will uh, uh, help in the uh, anchorage uh, uh, requirement of uh, that particular uh, uh, case. So how uh, do you construct this? Uh, uh, that's um, an important aspect as well. Uh, the base plate uh, is uh, an important part of it because that's the one which is covering the, uh, uh, the tissues and it's in close uh, approximation to the tissues. So uh, a construction of uh, this appliance will depend greatly on uh, uh, how well you have uh, constructed the base plate uh, so that it uh, prevents rocking and the displacement of the appliance in an anterior posterior direction. And also, uh, um, the base plate may be extended to cover the buccal teeth, which will uh, form something known as a bite block. And if you, if the same base plate were to extend on the anterior teeth, okay, that will uh, form uh, something known as uh, a bite plane or an implant plane. So these are used to correct different kind of malocclusion, maybe to uh, open the bite or you know to treat. Uh, you know, cross bites. Uh, also, uh, if you were to divide the plate or split the plate and uh, insert some screws in between, so they can also aid in, uh, you know, uh, giving you the flexibility to uh, 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 move the plates independently and thereby augmenting the anchorage. 
so that's how our removal appliances can be uh, used as uh, anchorage uh, units okay so with that we are at the end of uh, today's uh, uh, lecture on anchorage um, I think uh, uh, I will be visiting Anchorage uh, sometime uh, in the coming years. Uh, so I want to know if any of you have been to Anchorage. And so please do share your experiences with me. Um, with that, uh, uh, we shall wind up today's uh, lecture. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day. Bye.